Hey everyone, thanks so much for having us here today. Um, today we're gonna be talking about policy as code. Um, before we get started, allow us to introduce ourselves. My name is Adriana Vilela, and I am a CNCF ambassador, HashiCorp ambassador, blogger, and podcaster. I do have a day job. Um, I am a principal developer advocate at Dynatrace. I actually just joined like a week ago, so super fresh. Um, I spend most of my time in the observability and platform engineering space, and I'm one of the maintainers of the Hotel End User SIG. By night, I climb rocks. I'm so into it that I sprained my ankle two weeks ago, um, and sadly won't be able to check out any of the rock climbing here, which is making me cry. Um, but on a happier note, I love capivadas. They make me happy. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marino Widjay. I am a solutions architect at a company called Kong. If you've ever used an API, you have probably used an API gateway. If you've ever used Kubernetes, you might have touched Service Mesh. That's what I do. Also, oops, I should have changed the screen. <laughs> I, I live in the intersection of packets and procrastination, so you'll find me context switching quite a lot, but at the same time, I enjoy human and packet routing at the same time. Uh, one thing to note is that you know if you want to get connected with me, you could always find me on the blue skies. I'm trying to navigate away from that other platform eventually. And I'm going to kick us off to talk a little bit about what policy as code is. And before I do, ooh, did we uh, click present with Slido? I think we did, right? I hope so. Yes, we did. OK. Oh, score. All right. Okay. So let us have y'all participate in this conversation. Go scan that QR code. Yeah. And I'm grab my phone. I, I have the Jeopardy music queued, on, queued up on my phone, which I left down here. <laughs> Come on, Adrian. <laughs> You're doing so well, Marino. Stan, Stan Darf's policy is code. Control. OK, intent. Did I do it right? Security. OK, I'm loving, loving the terms here. What else we got? Consistency. Compliance, interceptors, autonomy, so much. OK. We'll give it another 10 more seconds, and then we'll wait for that timer to magically kick off, because I have no idea where we are in this conversation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. We had a lovely word cloud. We'll share it with you all afterwards. But policy as code is that intersection of taking your human language policy that you wrote, that you all decided upon, and writing that as code. So what does that actually mean? It means a lot of things. It means the ability to take an application, feed it into your pipeline, and then policy to be autom automatically wrapped around it with intent. But that policy was derived from a bunch of people having conversations, decisions, deciding upon what certificate manager, manager to use, what uh, firewall mechanism to use, what network policy to use, what authorization mechanisms to use. All of this was decided upon, but they codified it so that when you deploy your app, you have just-in-time security alongside it. So I want to ask you all, what are some of the benefits of policy as code? Because I'll share some, but I want to get your thoughts as well. Let's get back to that QR code. Oh, I can do the drop pre music this time. Oh, Jesus. Oh, no. It hates me. Come on. There we there go. We go. Okay. <laughs> All right, time's up. <laughs> okay. All right. It's interesting to see what that word cloud said. Compliance, security, consistency, repeatability. That's very interesting because that's exactly what those benefits are. When you're running with policy as code, you're actually codifying everything you said. You're basically turning that into something that is reusable in the form of YAML, that wraps around your application, that wraps around your container. But it also allows you to think about the ways you remove human error. When I used to write firewall policies way back in the day, sometimes I would mess up a subnet 
and lock myself out. But we avoid those things by actually deciding upon how we go about creating a policy and then how it gets rolled out into production down the line. One of the other benefits is to actually think about those guardrails that need to be put in place before things go into production. We simply just don't want to move things into production because we have access to. I'm gonna talk about a story very shortly. But when we actually decide, hey, we're gonna shortcut the process, move things into production, we actually open up ourselves to a lot of different vulnerabilities and potential attack vectors. So we also want to be able to enable our developer teams. You know, we don't want them to sit there and think about policies on their own. They don't need to sit there and write authorization policies. They don't need to sit there and bake in TLS into their code. That should just be implied and automatic. So as developers roll out their code, policy gets wrapped around it as well. And that final benefit is actually allowing developers to optimize the way they iterate and iterate quickly. But it also fosters something very interesting too. We'll talk about some more of those benefits very shortly, but it really leads to this idea of collaboration, something that we're all really fond of. So, Adriana, over to you. Thank you. So we've talked about the benefits, but there are some challenges when it comes to policy as code. But uh, before we get into that, we will pose the question to you. I swear this is the last one. I see Linux. Oh my gosh. <laughs> A word I would never have thought I'd hear before again. Third time's a charm. Okay, well, thank you everyone for uh, for your participation. This is really awesome, um, and. Um, we've come up with our own list of uh, challenges when it comes to policy as code, um, one of which is um, complexity in policy definition because we have complex systems, so our policies have to reflect that and ensuring that our policies are detailed enough and granular enough, but also taking into account the fact that our systems are constantly changing. So how do we make room for those changes? Um, we have a learning curve issue, right? Because policy as code means you're probably going to have to adopt some sort of policy as code tool, which means learning new way of doing things, right? Maybe some new frameworks, some new nuances of the tooling, maybe you're forced to learn some sort of new language. So you gotta bake that into uh, your timelines. Um, integration with existing infrastructure. Ooh, that is the age old question, right? We've got all these lovely tools that do all these wonderful things, but how do we ensure that they play nice with each other, right? Making sure that you know, your pack tool plays nice with your CI CD systems and with your public or private cloud infrastructure. Um, managing policy changes because our systems are always changing, so we need to ensure that our policies evolve with our systems, which means how do we uh, implement those policy changes without pissing our users off, right? Especially because ultimately someone's gonna make a mistake somewhere and you're probably going to implement the wrong policy or you haven't quite tweaked your policy um, the, the way it should have been, so how do we manage all of that stuff? and then balancing flexibility and security. So again, we have this issue where we wanna ensure that um, we have that security and compliance aspect when it comes to our policies, but how do we ensure that we also don't have this introduce like more red tape into our systems whereby it takes so long to roll out those policies? So um, are there ways that we can ensure that our, uh, our policies are self-serve? Uh, we also have scalability. As our systems grow, our policies must also scale. Um, testing and debugging policies, because guess what? Policy as code means you're treating your policies as application code, which means that you have to also be able to test them and debug them and take action when needed. Um, visibility and auditing, guess what? Observability of your policies, so when a policy is breached, we have to know when that happens, who did it, and take the necessary actions for it, um, especially because it can have some serious consequences if we don't do that. 
Um, collaboration across teams, this is a big one. We have this problem that we see oftentimes where those crafting the policies aren't necessarily uh, talking to the ones who are the recipients of those policies, um, especially when it comes to setting up our new laptops for work and installing software. Who's experienced that, eh? <laughs> Um, and then finally, tooling limitations, because you know there are tons of pack tools out there. Each of them does wonderful things, but each of them also has their own shortcomings. So being aware of uh, what's good and bad in these tools and seeing how these tools can fit into your own ecosystem is extremely important. Okay, so as I mentioned before, one of the big items um, that comes up when it comes to a policy as code challenge is having that silo. Um, and so Marino and I are each going to share some personal stories um, on the consequences of, of the siloing. So I'll start with me. So once upon a time, I was a member of a, uh, I was a manager of a platform engineering team. And this team uh, basically it managed an in-house um, HashiCorp Nomad enterprise stack. And, um, and this was running on um, private cloud infrastructure managed by OpenStack. And the team had come up with this great internal tool to automate, uh, to, to basically give development teams the ability to provision new pre-configured virtual machines that they could be added as nodes to this HashiCorp Nomad cluster. And so this was wonderful. Like it, you know, it, it meant that our team didn't have to do a bunch of manual stuff and, and, and the dev teams didn't have to wait on us, but there was one problem because when it came to provisioning those VMs, um, we were stopped by InfoSec who said, oh, sorry, we have to review the security policies. And this is where it was a little bit unfortunate. Um, we tried to have that conversation with InfoSec, but they didn't trust our team enough to implement those policies on their behalf. And I think this is where having policy as code tooling would have been extremely beneficial. So I'm going to hand over to Marino to share his story. Oh, I've got a mic, don't okay. worry. <laughs> so you know what? I actually learned, I actually have more stories. I mean, I've got plenty of stories. I work in the service mesh space, and sometimes we like to do things very simply and easily. I'm working with a very large team and a project at the moment. And initially, when we kicked off this project, one thing I noticed is the siloing that's actually going on within the different teams. So you have multiple different teams that are application owners, and they build infrastructure to support, their, support those applications, but they're all doing things very independently. So for one particular situation, a team wanted to move into production rather quickly, but bypassed things like the certification or certif certificate ops teams, as well as some of the other security teams as well. Now, that's all great and well until you hit a vulnerability. When you're using something like a built-in certificate authority, guess what? Initially for dev, that's fine, but when you move into production, we know that's not a good idea. But someone caught wind of that and basically put a huge, or slammed the brakes on the entire project and said, look, we can't just simply move into, the produ into production, we won't approve it. So one of two things happened. The first thing is a bunch of meetings, obviously, because guess what? We have to sit there and decide upon how we make this all work for that one team. But another thing happened. We actually involved a platform engineering team who actually will be owning all of the infrastructure, all of the architecture for all these application owner teams down the line. So bringing them, in, bringing them on board allowed us to decide, hey, why can't we create a process, a codified process for them to create a pipeline for certificate gener generation to pull from something like an upstream, uh, you know, pr uh, upstream CA or root CA, I should say, and then pass that down to, let's say, a sub CA. And then on the other hand, have another process in place to call on pipelines that do Terraform. So we don't have to reinvent the automation for infrastructure. We don't have to reinvent some of that policy that we have to already deploy anyways. And so as a result of this, right, now we have more teams communicating collaboratively where they can go and reuse a lot of those existing artifacts. Yes, the project means that it's a little bit delayed, but now we're doing things correctly. Now we can go back and track how we codified a lot of our discussions, and now this all has become policy. So let's talk about bridging all of those silos with policy as code. Now, let's think of the traditional example where a developer gets super excited about an app idea that they create, they build it on their system, 
you know, it's, it's running on my system, let's move it into production because I've got access to my cloud environment. And boom, it's out there. Until something happens, until it falls apart, until it's that one single dependency that breaks and then everything else falls apart too around it. So to get around that, one thing that has to happen is gating. You have to have a gated process where peer reviews need to come into place, where security teams can actually determine if we decide we wanted to attack this application, what would be the different holes that we would find based off of these, these attacks that we do? And so we have to find a way to patch this before we actually even get to production. So let's, let's move to a much more thought out process. So we decide we've got a brilliant idea, we'll build the application, we'll then you know, do some testing, we'll move it into the developer environment, We'll get some code reviews done, some peer reviews, and then we'll go through a remediation step because someone's gonna identify a number of different issues. But guess what? Because all of this is stored in something like a source control system, now everyone has access to it, or well, the intended parties have access to it. They can dive in and they have the ability to go and review different parts of that application, different parts of that code, and then mark their comments. We do this today anyways in different parts. We do this when we develop our applications. Why can't we do this for security as well? So once we've remediated, then we go back to that process where we're addressing and adjusting and fixing our code or applications, patching it appropriately, wrapping the right policies or the policy labels so that at runtime or when it goes to production, the policies get slapped on as well. It moves into production, it runs well, it never gets hacked or maybe one day it does, who knows. Now, I'm gonna pass it to Adriana to talk about the PAC tools and best practices. Thank you. Okay, so, you know, we've been talking about PAC, but what tools can help enable this? Um, we're gonna show you a list of tools, obviously not a comprehensive list, just to give you a taste. So we've got things, tools like Kyberno, um, Open Policy Agent, we've got Opal, that's on the CNCF front, nice and open source. Um, then we've got some vendor tools, including Permit, um, HashiCorp Sentinel, and AWS IAM. Now, if you're wondering how these tools stack against each other, we put together this lovely table. Um, feel free to take a picture, because I'm not gonna go through all of that. Um, just leave that on for a couple more seconds. Do we need the Jeopardy uh, music again? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. All right, I'm gonna switch slides now. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, cool. All right, so um, with these tools, regardless of what pack tool you use, there are some best practices that we should be following. Um, so first of all, as I mentioned, policy is code. There's the word code in there. Treat it as application code, which means, among other things, you're going to be version controlling your policies. Um, also, adopting a modular design, because that way we can have reusable components. Um, we want to be able to automate our policies with CI CD, not just the deployment of our policies, but also um, when it comes to testing our policies, right? Because again, this is code, we need to make sure that they work. Um, and then making sure that our policies are documented because nothing sucks more than having some sort of policy that's codified and you have no freaking clue what it does. All right, we have a few more best practices that we wanna cover and one thing to consider is implementing that policy auditing and review and monitoring phase right before it goes into runtime or into production. When you create a policy, you have to audit it. You have to make sure it's legitimate, valued, and it's valid. It actually makes sense for the applications that you're running through or deploying. But then as your application evolves, that policy also is, has to evolve as well, and it needs to be continually audited. But you also need to monitor it. What if someone makes a change to that policy to let's just say shortcut a process and then you know, make sure that something actually works and then forgets about it? That could be problematic down the line. Another best practice is to consider a centralized policy management system. You have network policy, you have authorization policy, you have your access policy, you have auditing policies, logging policies, all these different kinds of policies that exist and different tools that you create these policies in. So it's ideal to start thinking about a centralized way to tie them all together so that they seem very stitched and cohesive. Git is a place that we store our source of truth, not the place that we tie this all together. Yes, we can go and reference it, it might be documented very well, 
but then that there has to be a system that can implement some logic that assesses the different layers of these policies that need to be implemented for our applications. We also want to consider a role-based access control management system as well. We want to think about everything as an object doing something in that environment, and it has to have some sort of role-based access control attached to it, meaning it should only be able to do what it needs to do and nothing else. It should only be able to read what it's supposed to read and nothing else. And then we also want to consider a stronger focus on that security and compliance. If you think about the compliance nature, think about things like HIPAA, PIPEDA, GDPR, uh, PCI, for example. There are various verticals that take on these different styles of uh, compliance, and they have to adhere to them in various ways. Policy as code is one of the best ways to do that, because now you can think about wrapping multiple layers of policy in different forms for that application. And then finally, it's the element of starting very tiny and then incrementally growing to the point that it's sustainable, but also reusable, repeatable, that you can iterate it, that you can understand it, that it makes sense as to why you even built that policy or the policy wrapper to begin with. Pass it back to you. Okay, well, this brings us near the end of our talk. We're just gonna do a quick review of what we've learned today. Take notes, there will be a quiz, just kidding. Um, okay, so we learned today that policy as code is awesome because um, it keeps things nice and secure and compliant for us, and who doesn't love that? Um, nothing worse than auditors um, on your back, so this helps. Um, we want to make sure that we're treating our policies with the respect that we would our application code. We want to make sure that we choose the right tool for the job. And finally, making sure that we treat policy as code as a team sport, we don't work in silos, we need to ensure that those crafting the policies are consulting with those who are the recipient of the policies. And we're gonna leave you with some uh, resources reference, shameless self promos before we wrap up. Um, I have a podcast called Geeking Out and I've had some really cool guests on including um, Kelsey Hightower, Abby Bangser, um, Marino's been on and uh, Hazel Weekly, and uh, also um, I've got a blog on Medium with various articles on platform engineering and on observability, so if you like reading, check it out. Yeah, and I write blogs on platform engineering and associated technologies, and I also stream quite a bit on a variety of CNCF technologies with a lot of Kubernetes influence. And a hint of networking, or actually a lot of it, sorry. <laughs> um, but go check it out, go check out those, those resources. And if you have any questions about our talk, we may not have enough time to answer them now. Come find us afterwards. We're around, I'll be here till Wednesday, and you'll be here all week, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm leaving, on, leaving on Friday, so um, you can find me at the uh, Hotel Observatory booth. That's where I'll be hunkering down most of my time. Um, also, we do, we do wanna acknowledge that the images created today were created by AI. Thank you to our evil AI overlords. Uh, <laughs> Dolly 3, powered by Bing AI. Um, I'm not an artist, but I think I'm an okay prompt engineer, and we leaned into our, the fact that we're both Canadian with the beaver theme, so hope you all enjoyed that. And uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thank you.